Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Yo, 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 it's me, Kyle. Anyway, um... Okay, so this is, uh... I'm just gonna hide myself a little bit. Uh, this is going to be probably the hardest one, personally, uh, just to talk about, but uh, this lesson is going to be about uh, abortion. But we don't need to be afraid of this topic. It is something that is mentioned in the Bible a few times, but I'm going to be focusing on a very specific part of the Bible, which I found a lot of revelation uh, and understanding given to me on the topic. Also, uh, my mom and I read the scripture together, and she is a mother, as a woman, who I feel like is much more in touch with the side of God, you know, that deals with birth of children, of his children. It's, she saw even more than I expected there to be. So I, I want to share that with you guys. And just, you know. Okay. This isn't a very long lesson. It's very to the point. And uh, hopefully we can just stick together and not cry. I noticed the scripture when I was actually preparing for the other lesson about the fig tree. When I was reading Luke, I turned to Luke chapter 23 and found a scripture starting at verse 28, which, which is during when Jesus is walking with the cross uh, to be crucified. He speaks to the women of Jerusalem, and this is what he says. So, Luke chapter 23, verse 27 to 31. Starting at verse 28, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Okay, so this is the first bit that actually drew my attention, obviously. I underlined weep not for me and weep for yourselves and children. I underlined children. So this is a pretty direct line that's saying something about children at some point in time for the women of Jerusalem. And I do believe that part of this message is very much just for the chosen people, the Israelites, but also for people in our time and women, barren women and women bearing children. So, it's for you, women. All right, starting at verse 29. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? Okay. So this means a few things I've come to realize. In fact, God is good. Glory to God. I actually just had something revealed to me right now, reading it for the fifth, sixth, seventh, tenth time. How many other times I've read it? So first we're going to go over what it's, what the very uh, clear first meaning is. So in verse 29 it says, For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bear, and the paps that ne which never gave suck. So this is, I believe, talking about the end times, saying, Blessed are the women who cannot have children, for they will not suffer through this tribulation, and blessed are the babies which, which never were born, for they should not suffer through this tribulation. Basically saying... Having children close to the end times, if you are not sure of your salvation or their salvation, you know, depending on the age of the child, um, 
because there is a point at which children are, are no longer blameless and they do have to accept Jesus. If you are not sure and you have older children, you know, you, unfortunately, if they have to go through that tribulation, it'll be rather heart-wrenching for everyone involved, including God. Um, then they shall begin to say, mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us. Uh, this is, I believe, talking about the pain that's going to come during the tribulation uh, with all the natural disasters, the plagues, and things like that. Like, they will be in so much pain uh, or shame. They will have so much shame that they will wish to be buried. They will wish to have it covered. Uh, for if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? Um, and I, what I think this actually means is I did not understand how this fit contextually with the idea of the tribulation and with the end times. But actually, now that I think about it, a green tree means something that's alive. And currently, right now, the Holy Spirit lives upon the earth and every one of us. And when you receive the second birth, when you receive Jesus in his fiery baptismal, you are livened again in the Holy Spirit. Because after a certain point, well, when we are born, the Holy Spirit is deadened within us. But when we accept Jesus into our hearts, uh, it is livened again. During the tribulation, there is going to be a removal of the Holy Spirit from the earth. As the church is raptured, so shall he who is within us be removed. So that would be a dry that would be a, a barren tree. So I think what it's saying is that if these atrocities and evil things can be committed while the earth is still alive, then what will happen when we are dead in the spirit, when the spirit has left us? Okay, now to get to the next part of it. So it also can take a very literal meaning. So when they're saying, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck, uh, then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us for these. If they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? Um, you know, so I think what it's saying in this sense, if you take it very literally, it's saying, blessed are women who can't have children and their children, which they cannot have um, because there are women who live in a green tree, meaning women who can have children, um, you know, for if they do these things, these things being killing their children. And so then above this I wrote, one day barren women will be glad for when they see fertile women killing their children, they will be horrified. And this is talking about abortion, I believe. Uh, you know, I hear I wrote in the in verse 30, I believe means a punishment for evil, burial, finality. There's also a scripture here in Isaiah 46, verse 3, that says, Hearken to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried by me from the womb. And this is a very interesting scripture because this is literally saying that, yes, women physically birth children, but for God, each child is a spiritual birth. That every time a child is born, he is also with that woman in these birth pangs. That he births each of these children. That he molds, stitches together, forms these children in the womb. They are his as much as they are any woman's, any man's. Every child is God's. So, you know, that's why I believe it says, then they shall say to the mountains, fall on us into the hills cover us. This is really reminiscent of a scripture that speaks about if you do not praise the Lord God, that there will be a time where he, the earth will be so desperate and like he will be so desperate for praise that the trees will cry out and the rocks will, will weep and praise him. Is that insane? Because we, we aren't praising God. The ground, the, the things that should not speak will speak his name. Um... All right, and then if you take the scripture in Luke 23, verse 34, it says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Um, this is a very interesting parallel because Jesus is a son who is being killed um, for the greater good. 
And there's so many women that believe that abortion is for the greater good, that a woman's choice to kill her child, um, you know, no matter this. And yes, there are circumstances they give, right? But, but the majority of those circumstances are not a majority of the abortion, sadly. And even if that was the reason, it's still not the excuse. Probably gonna get a lot of backlash on this, but on this video, because I am strongly saying that abortion is uh, Look, I understand that it's your choice. Right? That's what everybody likes to say. There are women who obviously are not making the choice, who have been raped, molested by parents or strangers or family members or, you know, any of the above. And it feels disgusting to let something live where half of it is an oppressor, a cr criminal, an evil, evil person who did something evil to you. <sighs> I mean, but I'm sure you understand it's wrong. Right? I mean, that person should be punished, not your unborn child. And for the other women out there who have sex and make the mistake of having sex and then having a child, um, it's not your choice anymore. You did make a choice. Your choice was to have sex. Your choice is gone after that. When you have something growing inside of you that will become a person one day, your choice is gone after you have sex. Like I just said, for the women who did not make that choice, I'm appealing to like your morals, right? Because it's not the child's fault and it's not your fault. And there are so many other options besides killing your kid. Um, and I, I, I understand there are all these scientific facts that say how harmless it is, how painless it is, how good we've gotten at it. Doesn't that make you want to just vomit everywhere? That we've gotten really good at extracting tiny pieces of person from people's bodies? Or just like contracting, uh, inducing a chemical contraction within the uterus? that roughens the uterine lining and then like it just sheds prematurely and we just eject a baby like it's a, a mass of flesh and not your child. It shouldn't be a choice. Yeah, it is, it is your choice to do it, but it should not be a choice. When I read this scripture, uh, there is another scripture that is placed into the space between uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 34 and verse 36, which takes you to Psalms chapter 22, verse 17. I realized when reading it um, that it is a prophecy. It is a prophecy uh, for the death of Christ. It starts at verse 12. Many bulls have encompassed me. Strong bulls of Basham have been set me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, 
and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For days, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. This is a scripture that's talking about Jesus being crucified, right? Right? It sounds completely like it. Um, and it amazed me because I've never read this scripture and thought that before. But God is good. Amen, God is good. My mother read this. And I had read the Luke scripture to her about abortion. We'd been discussing it and, and weeding out certain things that made sense and didn't make sense and, and waiting for God's wisdom. When I read this to her, she had a revelation that she never had before. She told me that if I started at verse 10 and went to 17, that it was describing an abortion, a late-term abortion. And I was so confused because parts of it talk about hearts melting like wax and skin. And, and she said there's something called saline abortions. Now, I looked all this information up. Apparently, it's not a procedure done anymore. Um, I don't agree with that, especially with the fact that New York and Virginia, I believe, have just passed um, end-term abortion laws that you allow you to abort your child until the end of a pregnancy. And saline abortions are apparently the most effective way of killing a late-term child. When a saline abortion is done, it burns the child and melts their organs. At least that's what I gleaned from the description and from what my mother told me because she has watched them happen as she's a medical student and dealt with invasive surgeries. Or non I don't know which category uh, reaching up into somebody's uterus falls under. But. Okay, let me just read it. So it starts at verse 10 this time. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Which, Isaiah 46, 3, it's very similar. It starts at verse 11 now. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have encompassed me. Strong bulls of Basham have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Oh, babies, their bones are out of joint, aren't they? Because they haven't formed yet. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they have pierced my hands and feet. Lots of the times uh, when, when late-term abortions happen, they do have to go in and sometimes remove limbs that are trapped uh, inside the womb or the uterus, like hands, arms, legs, feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. So there's a pretty common thing that when abortions happen, they, they do that process where if it's a later-term abortion and there are limbs missing that haven't been pulled out they will go in and remove them and then count them and like assemble the baby to make sure it is all gone of course i don't think that's wrong at that point i don't want a festering limb to kill a woman
But how could we? How, how could we do this? Matthew 26, verse 38, when Jesus is going to, to, oh, he's leaving the garden of Gamesh. Um, Matthew speaks to him and he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Um, I definitely feel a bit like Jesus right now. Thank you for all this and reading this. Okay, well, that's the end of the lesson. The, the scriptures are Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 21 to 36. And the Psalm scripture is Psalms 22, verse 10 to 18. And I read in King James. If you want to read in anything else, it's very similar, a little bit different. Still has the same message. I'm going to just say a few things. Um, I know this is going to be a divisive video. I know that there are going to be people who are going to feel defensive. There are women and men who are going to agree with me and disagree with me strongly. And there are going to be people who call me insensitive, whatever doesn't matter to me really so I'm really gonna make myself clear I am incredibly blessed as a human being um, in the way that we all are that God loves us and cares for us and wants to know us but also in a very personal and human way in that my family is amazing. I know that most people won't want to listen to a man talk about abortion um, because they feel like men are little to no part of that even though um, uh, we are. You know, not part of the birthing process, but we're definitely part of it. But I can speak on it because every man is not only a father, he's also a child. We're also sons. Um, just like daughters, every woman's also a daughter. So I think I can speak a little bit about abortion. I'll keep it very close to myself. My mother and father were very, very young. Not incredibly young, like high school age, but my father was 19, and my mother was... She was 21, but I was 19. My dad turned 20 on my birthday. I mean, they were children. Uh, they got married the month after I was conceived. So literally, like, they got a test, went to a doctor, found out I was there and then had like a month of stress because they had options, right? They had three options. D kill me. At the least divisive time, they found me early enough in the pregnancy that they could have just been like, yeah, just do it before he even has a heartbeat. Uh, they could have separated and had my 
grandparents like raised me and my dad not really see me uh, or they could get married and they got married and had me and it wasn't just because of me obviously they loved each other and they won't ever say this but I know they got married that fast because I was coming um, they wouldn't have done it that month, <laughs> I don't think. And you know how I know? Because I'm positive if the story, if I'm remembering it right, my dad proposed in a Walmart without a ring. So, they were like buying oil for the car, and he just proposed without a ring. And she said yes. And it's been 24 years. I thank you, guys. Thank you, God. That is a situation where a lot of women just get an abortion. Uh, I can't speak for those aborted children, but if I could... There are so many better people who survived something incredible at birth that could have killed them and are alive today and they live with illnesses, scars, deformities, but they just make them more beautiful people in God's eyes and my eyes. But you understand this, women who have done who've gotten an abortion. Whatever sin you committed before you accept him and were birthed again, that sin is gone. You are blameless again. Your child forgives you. God forgives you. Forgive yourself. Take the time. I'm not mad at you. None of us are mad. Okay, we all feel how horrible this loss of life is. We can all love each other through. We can get through with God, with his perfect love. This is a mess. <laughs> oh, this video is horrible at the end. I love all of you guys so much. Uh, thank you for even listening to this. Anyway, have a good night. God loves you. God bless you.